Tonight, we celebrate the class of 2014. Say hello to Razor Ramon, El Jefe. From Puerto Rico, Carlos Colon. Ladies and gentlemen, your host for the evening, WWE Hall of Famer, Jerry the King Lawler. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And good evening, everyone. Let me just tell you that tonight is going to be a celebration. I mean, that's right, a celebration. From a, a high-flying extreme diva to a, to a superstar who absolutely personified charisma and intensity. It is my honor to share the same stage with this year's WWE Hall of Fame inductees. And you know what? What better way to kick off tonight and this weekend than a celebration courtesy of Kid Rock. Now, Betty, what are we going to do tonight? I'm going to kick some ass! 
never know. Anything can happen at WWE. This is the brightest shot of the wrist. Oh yes, it's gonna be a celebration. And you know, did I mention a high-flying extreme diva? Let's take a look at our first inductee. around the edges and she had a tattoo on her arm and you know she was just different and she could do extraordinary things too. Lita could do moves that were better than a lot of the guys. She was so unique and she was herself. She was a badass. Things in the ring that no diva had ever done before. Lita never quit. These fans here letting her hear it. She was an inspiration to girls at the time. Lita brought a dimension that you've never seen out of a female competitor. She just came in there, she kicked butt, she looked beautiful, and she had her own style. That Trish and Lita rivalry, you wanted to watch it because it was so different visually and the ring work was so different. The main event, a physical match for the women's title here live on Monday Night Raw. No matter what, you put Lita and Trish on the screen together and fans like, oh, what's gonna happen next? Not this, no! Lita definitely made you think that what you always thought a diva was, it was something different. What is Lita going to do? Oh, my oh. God! She wasn't a girl. Lita was a chick. She was a hot chick. She was a cool chick. Lita just broke the barriers and stepped outside the box and kicked through the door and never looked back. Well, now our, for our first induction, please welcome an entrepreneur, a new mother, a WWE Hall of Famer. That's what they wanted me to say about our introduction, but I want to say please welcome one of the most beautiful, hottest divas ever to step in a WWE ring, Trish Stratus. <laughs> Thank you. This is so exciting, guys. You know, I was so excited when Amy asked me to introduce her. I mean, being an inductor is a huge honor, right? I mean, it's up there with being a maid of honor or like a godmother or something. And like, technically, I was her maid of honor at one point, right? I mean, it was a fake marriage and, um, you know, I was kind of self-appointed, but I think that still counts. And actually, Amy is the godmother of my child. So I think it's fitting.
Or maybe it's fitting because it seems our career destiny has paralleled since the beginning. So check this out. We debuted only a few weeks apart. We retired only a few weeks apart. My first match was with her, and of course, my last match was with her. We ran side by side as rivals for our entire career. And the cool thing is, is we'd go off and we'd create our own cool moments, but then, and we wouldn't even cross paths for months. But then the second that we got on screen together, we were just there. There was just that chemistry. And to have that built-in anticipation from an audience, and to have that sense of familiarity with another performer, you can't ask for anything more. It was because of this ongoing rivalry that we got to share so many epic moments. Probably one of our biggest moments was the when we got the chance to main event Raw. In 2000, we saw the red hair, we saw the tattoo, we saw the moonsault, and we were hooked. Amy was doing things we'd never seen from a woman. She was cool. And she dressed different than the other WWE women, you know? And, and girls were at home and they were like, hey, she kind of dresses like me. I mean, it probably wasn't the same level of fishnet that she had going on, you know? And she's like, the thong was kind of scandalous, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right? In a good way. But the point was, is she was relatable. And girls saw something in Amy that they saw in themselves. She's probably best known for her time with Team Extreme. And here's the cool thing about Amy and that group. You see, normally, the women, they're kind of like, they're like the side accessory, side dish thing, right? But in this case, Amy was an equal one-third of that group, right? And the three of them, they created this dynamic that gave girls and boys someone to relate to. You know, Amy, she kind of always had this quality that you're like, I just kind of want to hang out with this chick, right? And I can tell you that hanging out with her for seven, seven years in the WWE, and then, of course, post-WWE, because, like, we're really tight. Like, like we're like peas and carrots, you know, like peanut butter and jelly, like, like wrestlers and spray tan, you know what I mean? We just, we go together, you know what I mean? No, but seriously, I can tell you that she's a pretty awesome chick. She's a four-time WWE Women's Champion, a New York Times best-selling author, the only female WWE superstar to be on Rolling Stone's hot list, she single-handedly revolutionized the way one wears a thong. <laughs> her work with animals speaks volumes to her nurturing nature. She is proudly plant-strong. She was a source of encouragement, strength, and inspiration to so many, making her long dress debut, which is a big deal, okay, guys. She is my nemesis. She is my partner in crime. She is my bestie. She is Amy Dumas, better known as Lita. I'm just gonna take this in a minute. Um, the wrestling world, we're, we're kind of our own breed and different to maybe some movie stars that have their big speeches that they do that ends at their long career in a roast. Your, your, your entire career in the WWE is kind of like one big roast, but this is the moment that you get to soak it in and, and just, just see what's kind of going on for a minute. So thanks for this moment, I'm, I'm, I'm super into it. Thank you guys. Let's have some fun tonight. Did you guys, uh, did you ever hear the time about when I called the travel agent? We're obviously going back if we're even talking travel agents. You just did not click a couple buttons and get a flight, but 
I had this idea that I wanted to become a professional wrestler and I was going to go to the source. So I was going to go down to Mexico. I'd call a travel agent and say, uh, yeah, I want to go to Mexico. She's like, uh, okay, I'm going I'm to need a little more information than that. Acapulco, Cancun, Mexico City, Monterey. So I, I just, I, uh, where's Lucha Libre most popular? I'm going to go down and I'm going to be a professional wrestler. She's like, yeah, I, I, I have no idea. I, I book plane tickets. That's what I do. So I was like, okay, what's, what's the biggest city? She, Mexico City. It's the capital. It's like, all right, so, that sounds good. Let's do it. One ticket to Mexico City. So, so I'm off with a Let's Go Mexico book, three years of high school Spanish, and I've got a, a security plan where, you know, there's like heightened, there's a security thing saying nobody should travel unless they have official business. I had official business because I was going to become a professional wrestler. <laughs> so here was my plan, okay? I had the money that I thought I was going to need for the day in one pocket. I had a $20 decoy in the other pocket, and I could just throw that at the robber and run away. And then I kept another 20 in my bra, to, you know, for an emergency in case I had to throw the, the 20, and then I had 20 left to maybe catch a cab back to somewhere, I don't know. Uh, I still use that theory, because uh, you never know where you're going to be in some sort of sketchy part of town. So I get to Mexico, throw my bags in, I'm going to go down and ask the hotel owner, donde esta la lucha libre? And then I'm off, right? So I hop down, donde esta la lucha libre? Turns out the owner is from Spain and there's no lucha libre there. This, this now concludes the planning section of my trip down to Mexico. That's all I had. So I love a scavenger hunt. I hit the streets, start asking donde esta la lucha libre, make my way to Arena Mexico. Arena Mexico is like Madison Square Garden of Mexico. I run in, buy a ticket from a scalper off the street. I run down. I'm so excited for my first Lucha Libre match. Stop to take it in right before I sit down. There's a dirt floor. There's a ring, but there's, there's three of them, and it doesn't look like anything that I've seen anyone wrestle in on TV. Right as I'm like, okay, what, what's, what's happening? An elephant comes out of the curtain, and I'm at the circus. <laughs> Not off to a, a great start, but it uh, turns out Arena Mexico is where the Lucha Libre is, except for the two weeks out of the year where everything is moved to the B Arena, Coliseo. So I start over, my scavenger hunt. I make it to Coliseo the next day. Scalpers are like, scoring, because I buy another ticket off the street, front row seat, get into my first match. I am sat in the front row next to a woman named Guille, who's in her mid-60s and has not missed a Lucha event in 35 years. It's pretty impressive. I am so excited. She's telling me everything about everyone, who all the good guys and the bad guys are. I'm like, I'm, I'm in. This woman's going to see to it that I become a professional wrestler, right? This uh, director of press comes over and he says, um, what are you doing here? And you know, if I can help you with anything, I'll let you know. I, I don't know how the gringa in a sundress stood out in this arena, but he knew to come over to me. I said, yeah, I, I just need to know a couple things. Um, I, I'm here because I want to be a professional wrestler. And um, where's the subway? Because I took a cab here, and I don't have enough money to get back. He, he, he laughed, thinking I've just told him now two jokes. But I was serious. So hanging out with Guille, she's giving me the inside tips. He then comes back and he said, no, the commentators have invited you. You can come sit in the booth and listen to the matches. I was like, whoa. Hang out in the commentating booth. And I hear them mention, I can't really understand what they're saying all the way, but they say, we have a, we have a special friend with us tonight. And she's watching her first match from North America all the way here from Mex you know, to Mexico. And I was like, man, I'm famous. They just talked about me on Mexican TV. But I wanted to get back. I wanted to get to the front row, in the thick of everything. I'm next to Gay. We're yelling, booing, screaming, chanting. Luchadors are flying through the air, landing at our feet. And we were all bonded in that arena because we were watching something special. And I know that all of you guys here can relate because that's what we're going to be feeling tomorrow at WrestleMania 30. That's what hooked me, that bonding right there, watching it all happen. So 
Finally, I think they decided all of the photographers, commentators, wrestlers, press agents believed me, or at least thought I wasn't going to go away, and my answer wasn't going to change. Why are you here? I'm here to be a wrestler. No, seriously. So they finally granted me permission to go into the gym at CMLL in Arena Mex, which was the home of the circus. There's uh, wrestling mats on the ground, garden, hopes or garden hoses around poles, and Los Puricuas, which at that point was consisting of Ricky Santana, Miguel Perez, Kevin Quinn, and uh, Dave Sierra, the Cuban assassin. They're like, so what are you doing here? Same thing, here to be a wrestler. Ricky's eyes light up. He's like, well, I'll take your head off if that's what you want. <laughs> that's what I wanted. So that was my first day breaking into the business. I took pictures of those bruises as a badge of honor. It was kind of solidifying me as one of the boys' club from there on out. And uh, around that time, I started to get my big, my big debut on television. So Raeli Jalisco Jr. was one of their big guys. And at the time, El Steele was working down there, who later became Val Venus. Yeah. Val Venus. I get invited to be in my first pre-tape. So I'm sitting on the couch with Val. Rio de Jalisco busts in and he says something like, I'm sure, like, I'm going to take your mask, I'm going to beat you up. I scream, I run away. It's my first day at the office. It's like I'm the first day I get to be on television in this wrestling world. They all go to leave. He leaves his mask, so I take it. <laughs> Sorry, Rio de Jalisco Jr., did you want this back? So this all happened due to another man that I saw in a mask. It's Rey Mysterio Jr. Once I saw Rey Mysterio, I was like, man, he's like a rock star and an athlete and a superhero, and I'm feeling everything that he's trying to portray to me, only his face is covered. I got to go do this thing. So I go to my first wrestling event. It's in the Col uh, Coliseum at, in Macon, Georgia. I pull up. I pull up to the arena in my car with my license plate that read, Rey Jr. won. Huge mark. Big fan. I watch this match, I'm like, like I'm studying for a final exam. Everything I need to know, what I, what I need to learn to become a professional wrestler. As I'm leaving, these guys and the, the guys are walking to the car and they're like, oh, we're gonna go try to meet the wrestlers that they're staying at this hotel. Okay, I don't even know where a professional wrestling school is in the country where I live, and these dudes in the parking lot know where these guys are staying. So I go to the, I go to the hotel and I'm like, um, just gonna kind of see if I see Rey Mysterio lingering around anywhere so I can see if, if, if I find him, I'm gonna tell him that I'm gonna become a professional wrestler. I very awkwardly go around, don't see Rey Mysterio, so I go to leave. And uh, it's not Rey, but I do see Arn Anderson. Arn Anderson says, uh, so where are you off to so quickly? probably picks up on that I'm feeling super out of place and awkward. And I was like, well, I was just, I was gonna looking for Rey Mysterio. I wanted to tell him I'm gonna go down to Mexico and become a professional wrestler, but I don't see him, and so I'm, I'm just gonna be going. He says, oh, no, you're not. You're not leaving until you meet Rey Mysterio. And it's fans like you that enable us to live our dreams and do what we love, so uh, I'm gonna make that happen. It's pretty awesome. So before we know it, we're over at the front desk. And he's like, all right, Penny, put Gutierrez on the phone. He hands him the phone. There's no Rey Mysterio. He's like, all right, Penny, give me your number. He's like, well, sir, you know, I, I can't do that. He's like, Penny. Now, Arn is going to stare down with Penny until Penny is going to give Arn Rey Mysterio's room number for us to go so I can tell him I'm going to be a wrestler. I'm like, this is an awful idea. How do you tell one of the four freaking horsemen that, uh, no, 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 I'm just, I'm gonna go, it's cool, we're good. You don't, you just, you just go with it, you roll with it. 
So I'm rolling with it. Next thing you know, we are right in front of the elevator. He goes to push the door to go up to Rey Mysterio's room, and he comes out of the elevator. Rey Mysterio comes out of the elevator. It does not make me feel like a total idiot for being like, I'm going to go become a professional wrestler in Mexico. Arn says, well, I'm a man of my word. You owe me a Miller Lite, and you owe me a Miller Lite. My work here is done. Now, Arn, I know you are a man of your word, and I am also a woman of my word. It is long overdue, but I do owe you a Miller Lite. So let's do this. Ray and Arn, we got two Miller Lights for you. <laughs> Trish and I up the wheatgrass shots. Are we waiting? Do we wait? What's the protocol on this? Cheers. Cheers. Arn's double fisting over there, Ray, just so you know. What's up with that? I finally see Ray years later as a coworker, and he's like, so I guess you found the Lucha Libre, huh? I go and I start working, all the indies were armed with this information. I finally got some phone numbers to where some, some local wrestling schools were a little closer than Mexico. End up at an ECW show with a six month stint there. It was Heat Wave 99, that was my first pay-per-view. I was teamed up with Roadkill and Danny Doring. So this was my first pay-per-view experience, as well as my first in a whole string of bizarre wedding proposals throughout my career. This, this one was, this touches my heart, it was a very special, the most romantic as Danny Doring gets down on one knee and proposes to me with not a ring, but a condom. Only in ECW, right? Ladies, this is how you know you've got a keeper. Not to be outdone by my marriage to the rated R superstar. I'd like to go on record and claim the most sluttacular wedding dress ever to appear in a WWE arena. And there was Kane. <laughs> All right, Cliff Notes version time. It's been, it's been a minute. Kane comes to me and says he's going to beat up my boyfriend unless I, ref unless I don't carry the seed of his demon spawn. OK? Wait, wait. And then he proceeds to beat up my boyfriend while I do carry his demon spawn, kidnaps me, and th puts me in the boiler room. This is a day at the office for me, guys. It was around this time that I ended up giving Gene Schnitzky his uh, catchphrase of his career. It was not my fault. Demon Spawn goes awry and all that. I met an autograph session. This little girl looks especially nervous as she's talking to me. I was like, what's up? Are you all right? She's like, um, are you OK? <laughs> it's like, I I'm great. Nice to meet you. How's it going? She's like, well, uh, I made you something, I'm just not sure I should give it to you. 
I was like, no, well, you made me something. I want it. Let's do this. What's up? She's like, hmm. I knitted you a baby blanket. <laughs> My counseling skills were not like on par. I'm in the middle of an autograph session. I was like, um, yeah, you know I wasn't really pregnant, right? So now I've just traumatized her. She looks up. I've traumatized her with my demon spawn pregnancy. And then I'm like, okay, just, just don't start crying because now I'm going to further damage you by telling you that Cain is indeed not a demon and not a monster, but only Glenn is one of the most favorite people that I've worked with throughout my WWE career. Fortunately, she was relieved with that information, hands me my baby blanket, and I still have it in the event that I have a future demon spawn. <laughs> we tend to live in a little bit of a bubble here on the road of the WWE. I get a call one day from the office and says, James Cameron has picked you personally to be in the season finale of Dark Angel. And I'm like, uh, who's James Cameron? So uh, he, he directed Titanic. He's like one of the biggest directors of our time. I was like, I, I, I haven't seen Titanic. When, okay, when am I going to, to go do this thing? So I, go, I fly to Vancouver for two weeks in between doing Raw to, to be a part of the season finale. And a stunt scene gone wrong, I was dropped on my head. Uh, I knew something was really wrong. I didn't want it to be. My mom had come down for the weekend and I, I had a season finale to shoot, but the show had to go on. They had to hire a stunt person to do my signature moves. That was a tough pill to swallow. Uh, we get the job done. I finally get back home. And by home, I mean a house show in Amarillo, Texas, where I feel safe again. Uh, back with my people, my WWE people. I start going into a series of doctors. And uh, about the third or fourth doctor tells me, they're like, you need to go straight to the hospital. It's like, no, no, I need to go to an autograph session about 45 minutes from now at the Blockbuster, because that's where I'm, I'm advertised to be. He said, well, um, your neck is broken. All right, so I, uh, I strap on a hard collar. It was the release date. I can't make this up. It was the release date of my bobblehead that I was doing a signing for. I do the autograph session. I go to the hospital. When I get to the hospital, I flip on Raw. I'm like down the street and I feel super weird uh, not being at the show. So I'm just up pacing around, Raw's on, I'm not there, I'm uncomfortable. The surgeon comes in, he's like, you need to lay down. He said, anything that you need to get up for, you, you have a nurse do it for you, I need to perform emergency surgery on you. Your neck's broken in three places. If you cough, sneeze, trip, you can be paralyzed. Uh, yeah. It was intense. I was there with uh, the athletic trainer. He said, like, what do you want to do? You know, it's up to you. And so I just sat there. I was like, so either my, my career, the, the doctor said, you'll make a full recovery, but I'm going to go in through the back and you're never going to be able to wrestle again. So I um, sat there, and I decided um, I wanted to talk to Stone Cold. So this is that bubble that we live in. I don't want to talk to the neurosurgeon that's gone to school for like a bazillion years. I, I don't want to talk to our athletic trainer that, whose job it is to kind of oversee us medically. I want to talk to Stone Cold Steve Austin. That's who I want advice from. I talked to Stone Cold. He's like, you come down to Dr. Youngblood. We'll fly there together. I'll, I'll ask all the questions. I've already been through this. And then uh, after you're, you're fixed up, we're going to this barbecue joint that I know about in San Antonio. So I go to Youngblood, he fixes me up. I wear my Stone Cold 316, t uh, my tank top into surgery. I come out, 
I'm fixed up. We go to the barbecue, Joy, and I go on to many more successful years in the WWE. I've got a list of thank yous, but this is the part where I reflect on that story and I'm like, that just happened? How did I do all that? That's crazy. So I want to thank all these people that took a chance on me and saw something early on. Uh, Danny McDevitt in MCW always gave me a couch to sleep on at the school. York and Matthews, also known as Bald Mercury, all the miles, bell to bell, if we could get there, we would get there. To Ace, Danny, and Kevin at the Steel Domain, who also gave me their knowledge, who also gave me a couch to sleep on, because apparently I was a pretty big mooch as I'm reflecting back. To the Funking Dojo, who treated me like one of the guys and pushed me when I needed it. Tommy Dreamer. What up? Always giving me an honest opinion. Always supporting me. Told me when I got back from Peru when I was wrestling, I got back to ECW, told me I got fat. <laughs> it's honest. It's what I need for my friends. Victoria. We had some awesome matches. Most notably, the first ever women's steel cage match. There can only be one first, and we did it. We had a really awesome group of girls in the locker room. I'm really proud to have shared the locker room with those girls while I was there. Manami Toyota. I have never met her. She's blown my mind, though. I think she's an amazing woman. Luna Vachon. She had my back from the day I met her. Terry Taylor, Dr. Tom, and good old JR. Not only did you bring my matches to life with your commentating, always there to give me an honest and experienced ear. I really appreciate it. Mick James. I watched her on the Indies. It was a really honor to have our last match together. S.A. Rios. I was a huge fan of his in Mexico, so it was an honor to start my career with him, and we've remained friends. I will always be friends with him. We spared, spent special moments together that I will never forget. Team Extreme. Huge honor to be the only woman in the TLC Boys Club. With the Hardy Boys, the Dudley Boys, and Edge and Christian. You guys right there, the crew, I see some of the same faces since the day that I've been here. You guys are lifers, and it's so awesome. To, I always knew I was in good hands with the amazing crew that we have. And uh, I'm thinking about Frank right now. <laughs> to my mom and to my brother, I never heard I was going to fail from them, unless my brother was giving me a hard time. Do you know how many autographs those guys have asked me for over the years? Zero. Zero autographs. That is priceless. I love you guys. <laughs> to Monster Jock and Anthony for sharing this night with me. Who would have thought that 20 years ago seeing dog bedtime stories that we'd end up here? 
I'd also like to thank the punk rock and hardcore scene. <laughs> Carrie Burke gave me a mixtape at the bus stop in the seventh grade that forever changed my life. The punk scene told me I could do what I wanted to do. They stood for things that were not popular amongst the mainstream. We were all bonded. If you knew what was going on, then you knew what was going on. My church was VFW halls, dirty clubs, and basements. The guys in these bands inspired me then. They made me who I am today and still inspire me now. I encourage you to go find your punk rock, to find your lucha libre, to find your professional wrestling, and let it lead you to your life. The punk rock scene told me I could do whatever I wanted to do, and that I could be whatever I wanted to be. And so I am. Our next inductee was uh, slithering around WWE rings well before Harry Potter started at Hogwarts. Take a look. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. From Stone Mountain, Georgia, weighing 249 pounds. What kind of man am I? Cruel but fair, that's true. Trust me. The Snake Roberts! Standing in the nation for this capacity crowd for Jake the Snake Roberts. They're on their feet! Jake was, just like his name, the Snake. Jake had a range unlike anybody else and a delivery unlike anybody else. It made him extremely unique. You don't play around with people like me. Because people like me, we just don't play. Nothing compares to the hatred that sits behind these cold eyes, my man. He didn't yell, he didn't scream. He just spoke very intellectually. You see, some people are imitators and other people are innovators, and I am an innovator. If this devil gets a hold of you, brother, you don't come back. Are we going to see it? This could be a yes! Look at that! Intimidation has always been the key to my success. And that's why the DDT has always worked. I love the way Jake Roberts hit the DDT. You can count to 100. It was quick. It was sudden. He's the innovator, and nobody has ever done it better. Short ride, bad landing. Without a doubt, you can't talk about his popularity without mentioning the snake. Damien? Oh, Damien will get his dinner, and he lusts for you. Yeah, what's in the bag? Huge snake! Oh, that gives me the willies just watching it! When Jake first unfoiled this python into the ring, you could hear people gasp all over the arena. Give him Damien. I'll tell you what, he could tear the house down night after night after night. Sooner or later, Damien will strike. Jake was one of those guys that the promoters talked about that could talk people into the arenas. I have something else that nobody else can offer. Everybody loves a mystery now, don't they? He could get on that same wavelength with the fans and really communicate with them. If a man has enough power, he can speak softly and everyone will listen. He was a mainstay. He was one of the guys that brought the entertainment factor to WWE Entertainment. I've always been the snake you should worry about. You are a sick man, Jake Roberts. Thank you very much. His mind for this business was just phenomenal. That's something that you can't teach. A great psychologist, 
has had the ability to capture your interest. A very rare find in our business. I am like a window too dark to see through. A mystery in my ways and my habits. The kind of man you'll never understand. Trust me. <laughs> and now for our next induction, please welcome the master of the diamond cutter and fitness guru, Diamond Dallas Page DDT. Yo, it's me, it's me, it's DDP. Thank you. Thank you. I can't even tell you how proud, humbled, and honored I am to be here tonight. It's like there's some kind of divine intervention going on. See, I say that because tonight's my 58th birthday. And I couldn't have asked for a better present to not only see one. Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy Thank you. Birthday! You're amazing. I can't think of having anything better than one of my boys, but two of my boys. Oh my God. Rising up to receive the recognition they so surely deserve. I want to thank you, Hunter. Very cool, man. You know, I always said, without Dusty Rhodes, there is no Diamond Dallas Page. The American dream, He gave me every break I ever had at the beginning of my career. For over 20 years, he has been my mentor and my friend. But I was lucky because I didn't just have one of the greatest of all time to be my mentor. I had two. Let me tell you a little bit about my other mentor. The one who taught me the art of professional wrestling. See, I was lucky enough to actually live with Jake the Snake Roberts back in 1994. Now, I had just got let go from WCW because I tore my rotator cuff. Well, let's just say it, I got fired. Hey, sometimes a negative turns into a positive. <laughs> Plus, they didn't believe in the 36-year-old rookie either. But that guy did, Dusty Rhodes, and so did Jake Roberts. Jake had called me up because he heard I was hurt to check in on me. He also told me that him and his girl at the time were split and he was separated. And we talked for a while. And when I got done with the phone call, I walked in. I was still married to Kimberly back then. And, and I walked in and I said, Kim, I got an idea. I said, Jake's split with his girl right now, and he's so, you know, he's looking for a place to stay. I said, we got that room downstairs. I go, wouldn't it be great if we let him stay there for a week or two, and he'll actually, you know, help me. I mean, he'll start to teach me what ring psychology is. And she said, okay, but there's one condition. No snakes in the house. <laughs> of course not. Over those next few months, I would learn more sitting next to Jake on the couch, watching my matches and him critiquing them. Watching his matches and critiquing them. And this went on. And after my shoulder started to heal, he started to get me booked with him on the road. 
And then this is going on about three months and it's really getting good. I'm starting to really learn. And then one night I'm back in the bedroom and I hear this wild, crazy laughter. What the heck was that? And then I hear it again. So I walk out of the bedroom and I look down the hall and I see Jake on the floor with the 12 foot black cobra. <laughs> what is he thinking? Oh my God. I start running down the hall. I run down the stairs and right as I get to the bottom, I realize it's Kimberly laughing. Oh my God. I'm going to let that giant sleep. I'm just going to keep walking. Don't even sell it. I walk in. I get on the phone. Jake, one of the things he was teaching me was dealing with promoters. So this is a big tour. We're going over to Asia. I got to get myself booked on this. 15 minutes later, I got it. I am so psyched. I walk in the living room to high five Jake, but there's no one in there. I look around. He comes walking down the steps. I'm like, dude, I got it, high five. And he walks right by me. Big problems, big problems. No, dude, I got the, I got the gig. We're in, no, no problems. Big problems, snake score. <laughs> what? Snake's gone. And fear is over his face, because he's not scared of the snake, but he's scared to death of Kimroy. <laughs> I go, dude, what do you mean the snake's gone? He goes, I put it in the bathroom, I was chilling him down, I just went in there and he's gone. What do you mean he's gone? So we walk upstairs, the bathroom's this big. I'm looking in because I am scared. Looking around, it's a black cobra. So I look in, I don't see anything. He looks down and he puts his head next to the vanity and he hits it. <sighs> Snakes do this. <sniffs> Cobras go. <sighs> he says, no worries. He'll be out in the morning. And he goes to walk by me. I grab his arm. I go, what do you mean, no worries? Get him out of there. He goes, I can't, man. He's got to, like, chill out. Eventually, in the morning, he'll come out. He goes, I'll come back in the morning and get him out. He goes, what do you mean you'll come back in the morning? You're not going anywhere. Of course, I was jabroni boy back then, so I can't stop Jake the Snake Roberts. Jake came back three days later. <laughs> Bottom line is, he wasn't living with me anymore. So he never stopped teaching me, though. I could bring, he got back with his girl, I could bring my matches off the road to him. He would talk to me about him. He'd make me figure it out, though. He didn't tell me, don't do this, do that. He taught me how to get over in and out of the ring. He prepared me for the main event and the world championships to come. It is a debt that I have been working on paying back ever since. Breathe. Ladies and gentlemen, our inductee, our next inductee, isn't just one of the greatest ring psychologists our business had ever seen. My friends, he wrote the book on it. Each word, each glance, every single thing he did in and out of the ring had purpose. His interviews were mesmerizing. His work in the ring, flawless. His feuds with the legendary great Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Yeah. 
the late, great, ravishing Rick Rude. And the truly immortal Randy Macho Man Savage. Oh, yeah! Dig it! will go down as some of the greatest feuds in the history of sports entertainment. His talents and contributions to our business are absolutely undeniable. About 18 months ago, Jake and I started another journey where we lived together. A wild roller coaster is all I can say. A journey we are entitled The Resurrection of Jake the Snake. Eight. Thank you. Eighteen months ago, our big pie in the sky fantasy dream was to somehow, some way, be on this stage on this very night. And we're here. Thank you, God. On so many levels, dreams can come true. As long as you're willing to put the work in. And trust me when I tell you, Jake Roberts has put the work in. Never underestimate the power you give someone by believing in them. Never underestimate the power you give yourself by believing in you. Our next inductee to the class of 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, I proudly present my mentor, my friend, my brother, the prodigal son, the one, the only, Jake the Snake Roberts! All of a sudden, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I know what I'm going to say. I've always loved professional wrestling. And I've always <clears throat> hated ties. <clears throat> And I've always loved the men that did professional wrestling because they're special men. They're a breed of their own. When I was coming up, I seen a lot of people that you guys have no idea who are. Hiro Matsuda, Duke Kamuka, Fritz Von Erich, and the list, Bruno, the list goes on and on. These men had such love for what they were doing. It was a passion beyond belief. I myself, I hated wrestling. 
I did because my father wrestled and I never seen him. And I figured it was wrestling's fault that I never had a moment with him. It wasn't the truth. It was the man. He was different. He was hell-bent on being a wrestler. And I could never understand that. And years later, I would hate wrestling for that and be damned if I didn't do the same thing. I walked away from the responsibilities of raising a family because I fell in love with something called wrestling. I did not have a minute to spare in any day because I loved wrestling. I should have shared the time more wisely because I don't regret loving wrestling because there's nothing on this planet like it. When, when you can get into that ring and look out there and control all those emotions, when you can make a child smile, when you can make an old woman pull a knife and try to cut your stupid ass, when you can have a young girl flash a certain smile, be careful. She does have a father. There's nothing like it. I always called it, oh, I can't say that, it was close, that was close. <laughs> See, Dallas, I'm getting better. Oh. Yeah, I gotta filter some things. <laughs> oh, what the hell, masturbating people's emotions? <laughs> that is what we do. Sometimes, sometimes we finish a bit too soon. Sometimes we don't get that timing just right, but that's what it is. You take people up, you take people down. You turn them around, you turn them upside down. You spank them on the ass, you tell them to sit in the corner. You can do anything you want. You don't understand what that high's like unless you've done it. And my God, that's addictive. Today, I'm 58 years old. I'm not gonna lie to you like Dallas. <laughs> Everybody knows he's at least 60. My God, look at us. And it hurts because I can't play anymore. Oh, I can still go out there and, and do a little something and get a few cheers and DDT somebody. Yeah, I can still do that. Where's Steamboat? He's got wall, what do I want? Just kidding. Uh, he, he's not 60 yet. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I just don't stop. I don't. No. You're wrong. My, my heart and my mind still want it. But it reaches a point where you can't do it justice. You see, because 
when I fell in love with that, that woman I call Vereen, I, I couldn't cheat on her, man. I'm ashamed to say that's the only woman I never cheated on, but it's the truth. It is, and I'm ashamed of that, because I was a rotten son of a bitch. No, it's not funny. Because at some point, your heart becomes so sour that you're no longer capable of loving just one woman. Because you've messed your head up. And then all the other problems start flooding in, man. Drugs and alcohol. Because you're wanting to medi medicate the pain that you have. Not so much the pain that you receive from the ring, but from the pain that you've shared with your family. And that, that really sucks. You can't look at the woman in the eye anymore. And you're tired of lying to your children. You don't want to carry on. Your career's gone. All you have in your heart is shame and pain. And you can't do what you love anymore. So what do you have left? Not much. Not much of anything. And if you're alone like I was, you make some bad choices and you decide that, you know what? I wish I could be one of those guys that didn't make it through the other side. And I was jealous of the, my friends that, that are gone. And I would get angry with God. Why not me? Please. I didn't want to commit suicide and hurt my children anymore. But for some reason, one person sticks a hand out. And that person for me was Diamond Dallas Page. Now, It wasn't going to be a job that just anybody could do because I was hell-bent, man. I didn't care anymore, man. I was doing drugs every day, alcohol every day. I didn't want to live. But if any of you, the, those of you that know Diamond Dallas Page, know what a stubborn, sorry son of a he is. He is the most positive, no good son of a gun on this planet. He won't shut up. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. If you ever had a bad day, Dallas, no, but you could change it and do this. That's Dallas. Dallas saved my life. I know that. And I'm so grateful that he saved it. And uh, he used you fans during that process. You see, I, I had a shoulder injury. I needed surgery, and I didn't have insurance. Man, I used that money on drugs. And he, uh, he said, you know, there's a thing called Indiegogo where the fans will chip in and pay for your shoulder surgery. I'm like, nobody gives a damn about me. And the fans chipped in $30,000 overnight it got my surgery and woke me up. It woke me up and told me somebody does care. I was given an innate amount of talent by God a long time ago. You guys got a little of it. I'm ashamed that I wasted a lot of it. But I am so happy tonight. I am so happy 
because uh, I've got some special people here. I call family. I uh, I have a hero. My hero is uh, 18 months old. He um, where's he at? Right there. Bring him, bring him up here. This young man has a sister out there. Look, he, he wants me to shut up. And uh, he weighed 1.8 when he was born. His sister weighed 1.11. They've had 10 surgeries each. They're still fed by tubes. And Vince, get your story writers busy because in 20 years at WrestleMania 50, this kid will be there. <laughs> Besides, he's already got the outfit, man. I'm not gonna go on because, man, I, I, I want to start crying. I just want to get back with my family. With my, with my family, my girls and boys, please stand up, because you're my heroes. I love them. They gave me a second chance. God bless the WWE because they gave me one too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it gives me great. Horse Hey, hey, hey. Guys. Guys. Stop. Stop. Take a look at our next inductee. Welcome everyone, Gorilla Monsoon here at ringside with my colleague Jesse the Body Ventura. On March 31st, 1985, the world watched as a global phenomenon was born. It featured the biggest stars from sports, music, entertainment, and... He was a household name. Everybody loved Mr. T. Anytime you need me, I'll be there, brother. He was a big star. 
He was on a big hit television show called The A-Team. The A-Team and Rocky III were very big at the time, and so that brought a lot of people interested in Mr. T to the WWE. When I looked for a partner, man, I had to look all over the world in the baddest dude I could find. That's what I wanted. Hulk Hogan managed to pull him aside for WrestleMania one, and, I mean, it was a home run. The whole world knows about this, man. <laughs> Hulk Hogan and Mr. T start to track right. the dream the team, man. The dream, dream team. team. It was WWE crossing over into being entertainment. I paid the food. I paid him the dead meat. Dead meat, that's why I say it. know if we needed Liberace. I don't even know if we needed Muhammad Ali. A slam by Mr. T as Piper goes down. Oh! Having Mr. T in the match was really important. Down for the cover, Brett Patterson. He got out. An essential part in the success of the first WrestleMania, Mr. T solidified his place in WWE history in one of the main events of WrestleMania II against Hall of Famer Rowdy Roddy Piper. You see, I dubbed this fight the Great White Hope against the Great Big Dope Brother. All right. This man's a chump. He ain't never had no gloves on. I thank you, he Mr. Can't even T. For him to be involved, it put our WWE superstars right on the same level with television and movie superstars. For his crucial role in bringing WWE to the forefront of pop culture, the WWE welcomes Mr. T into the WWE Hall of Fame Celebrity Wing. Look at me. This is a comeback zone. We're going to stay hungry, man. Mr. T, ladies and gentlemen, you heard what he said. And there's nobody can do the job like me. That's why they call me. You know I'm ready. And now to welcome our A-team hero to the Hall of Fame. Well, let's bring out my broadcast hero and fellow WWE Hall of Famer, Mean Gene Okerlund. I won't say time is marching on, but I had two guys out in the parking lot chasing me with shovels. <laughs> I couldn't miss this one for the life. I want to tell you something. Coming out tonight, this great crowd on hand in the big spectacular tomorrow, all in one weekend. I had to sneak out of the home to get it done, but I'm here. At this time, I'd like to introduce a gentleman, the newest in the class of 2014, into the WWE Hall of Fame. He is my very dear, close, personal, longtime friend, Mr. Mi Mr. T. Mr. T. I got to hearken us back to just about 30 years ago now, in Madison Square Garden. The date was March the 31st, 1985. The event, WrestleMania One. It was a goodie. In that main event, Mr. T teamed up with the gentleman here in the front row, Hulk Hogan, And they met the tandem of Rowdy Roddy Piper. I saw him out here. <laughs> Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. And in the corner was Ace Cowboy Bob Orton. Let me tell you something. That blew the roof off Madison Square Garden. Mr. T, a big, big part of it indeed. And here we are at WrestleMania 30. Tomorrow, is going to be a day to remember. Steve Austin, you're shaking your head. You know what I mean. 
Yet I've got to say that Mr. T had a very distinguished career prior to coming to WWE. Uh, there was a hot show called The A-Team. He was B.A. Baracus, and he did very well. Also starred as Clubber Lang in the movie, right, Rocky III. I'll tell you what he did have all along, and I could see it. When I'd look at him, he had a tremendous sense of fashion. I mean, the extensive jewelry collection that he had. God, if he would have thought that gold would be 15 or 1500 an ounce he would have sold out years ago. Probably would have hung on to it. And Mr. T also, I've got to tell you, uh, had a kind of a funny haircut. I badgered him for his barber's name, but he'd never give it up. Very unique. He still possesses it today. He's had a great run. He had a movie called DC Cab. He's done a ton of other things. But I want to introduce the man that's going to introduce him to the Hall of Fame. Please welcome the son of Mr. T, T Jr. Thank you, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it affords me the greatest pleasure to introduce to some and present to others my father, Mr. T. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be here and to stand among the very best in wrestling. It is with much humility that I joined the WWE Hall of Fame class of 2014. I am very grateful and very honored. But let me stop right here to pray, to give thanks to God Almighty for making all this possible for me. <laughs> Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity to give you all the praise and all the glory. I thank you for my health and my strength. I thank you for your grace and your mercy. I thank you for your blessings that you have bestowed upon me. And I thank you for being my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' holy name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Tonight, as you honor me, along with the other Hall of Famers, Please allow me a few minutes to honor and pay tribute to my dear mother, whom I love so very much. Please indulge me for a couple of minutes. I thank you in advance for your patience and your understanding, because it means a lot to me. I promise I won't be too long, and I hope I don't bore you. Now, my story and background is not, that, is not that unique. My upbringing is not so different from many others. 
But who knows? Somebody might be inspired. And maybe some wayward teenager just might find his way back home. That's why I want to talk about my mother. I thank God for my mother because I have seven brothers and four sisters. And my mother raised all of us by herself. Not exactly by herself, with the help of God, because with God, all things are possible. Thank you. I am the baby boy, the eighth son, the tenth child. We grew up in poverty. Crime and drugs was over us, under us, and around us. But crime and drugs was never in us. Why? Because we loved and respected our mother. Now, I'm not telling you this story so you can feel sorry for me, my mother, or my brothers and sisters. I'm only telling you this story so you can know how far we have traveled, how far we have come. And it's not how you start, it's how you finish. We were down, but we were never out. My mother told my seven brothers and I, she said, sons, nobody can keep a good man down. And in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 24, verse 16, it reads, for a just man falleth seven times and rises up again. That's why I want to talk about my mother because I worship the ground that she walk on. So beneath the Mohawk, underneath the tough talking persona, and behind the bad attitude is an old fashioned mama's boy who just, <laughs> is an old fashioned mama's boy who just happens to love his mother very much. Every time I think about my mother, it sends a certain feeling up and down my body. And I say to you, whatever you feel about your mother that causes that little emotional wheel to turn when you think of her, I want you to know I feel the same way about my mother. Because I believe that mothers are one of God's greatest creations. My, my mother, your mother, all mothers. Thank God for mothers. I believe the genius of God's soul expresses itself through the body of a mother like no other. Because nobody makes as many sacrifices as a mother, and my mother is no exception. For every sacrifice that she made, God rewarded her with the credit. Every inch added unto my mother's once streamlined waist when she was pregnant was a sacrifice. The first month when I was in there and the waistline got out of shape, one inch, the universe piled up one credit on her behalf. The more inches, the more credits. And my mother remembers when she used to look like the girl from Ipanema, tall and tan and young and lovely, walking like the girl from Ipanema. My mother didn't forget that eight or nine months later, when she looked like the girl on her way back from Ipanema. <laughs> she couldn't hardly make it. Her body was sore. She was tired because she had been scrubbing floors on her hands and knees as a domestic worker. 
But for every varicose vein, the universe pile up credits. For every morning of nausea, the universe pile up credits. For every discomfort and for every kick that I gave her and for every effort my mother's body had to make, her heart had to pump for two. Her urinary tract had to work for two. Her digestive tract had to work for two. And for all of that, God rewarded her with credits. Those pains, Thank you. For every hour of pain that she endured in labor to bring life from her womb, God said she is due credit. Those pains were sacrifices for every time consuming and energy sapping effort that she put into raising a family, washing and cooking, and every time that I cried and my mother didn't know why, God said she deserves credit. Back in 1984, I recorded a song entitled, Treat Your Mother Right. I dedicated that song to my mother. because I wanted my mother to know how much she meant to me. I wanted my mother to know how much that I love her. I wanted my mother to know that I love her every day, and not just on her birthday, not just on Mother's Day, not just on Valentine's Day or Christmas Day, but I love my mother on President's Day. I love my mother on Election Day, on Labor Day, Independence Day, Columbus Day, Earth Day, Memorial Day, Flag Day, Groundhog's Day, April Fool's Day, New Year's Day, St. Patrick's Day, and yes, even on Father's Day, I love my mother. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm just trying to tell you how I feel about my mother. Thank you. Thank you, mother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, mother, for all you done in spite of the hardships. I was born and raised in the ghetto, but the ghetto was not born and raised in me. I come from good stock, and the good fruit don't fall too far from the tree. Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verse 44, for a tree is known by the fruit that is bare. I come from humble beginnings. The slums, the projects, welfare and food stamps. But it's not where you come from, it's where you're going that counts.
We was poor financially, but we was rich spiritually because our mothers taught us good values. My mother taught us right from wrong. My mother taught us to do the right thing. My mother taught us to respect our elders by saying, yes, sir, no, ma'am. Please forgive me. I'm sorry, and thank you very much. My mother taught us to stay in school and study hard and don't talk back to the teachers. My mother taught us don't hang with the wrong crowd. My mother taught us to always pray and to study our Bibles. My mother taught us that if you want something, work hard and save your money and get it. And when we need to be disciplined, my mother got that big, thick strap and whipped our behinds. Thank you, mother. And what? Thank you. And when I got sick, my mother never left my bedside. I would wake up and see my mother praying to God, hoping that I recover soon. Thank you, mother, for caring so much, because all I ever wanted to do was to be a good son to my mother. When I was nine years old, I drew a picture of a house, and I ran home to show it to my mother. And I said, Mama, one of these days I'm going to be big and strong. I'm going to be a football player and a boxer. I'm going to buy you a beautiful house, Mama, and I'm going to buy you pretty dresses. My mother hugged me real tight with tears welling up in her eyes. She said, Son, if it's the Lord's willing. Well, it was the Lord's willing because I did grow up to be big and strong, and I bought my mother that house and pretty dresses. Because my mother did the very best she could with what she had, and I wanted my mother to know that she did not suffer and struggle in vain. I wanted my mother to know that I heard every word she ever said to me. I wanted my mother to know that I felt her love. I wanted my mother to know that her love comforted me. Her love was like a blanket on a cold Chicago's night. My my mother's love for me was stronger than any peer pressure from the streets. My mother's love for me was stronger than any gang influence. I wasn't afraid to get a whooping. I wasn't afraid to go to jail. But I loved my mother just too much. I loved my mother too much to disrespect her. I loved my mother too much to disobey her. I loved my mother too much to dishonor her. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, Chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Joseph said in the book of Genesis, chapter 39, verse 9, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? I say, how can I tell my mother that I love her, then get arrested for breaking into somebody's house? I would be a liar and I would rather die and burn in hell than to bring dishonor or disrespect to my mother. I love her too much. I want to... Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank my seven big brothers for setting good examples for me to follow. 
I want to thank my brother Clarence, William, Jesse, Charles, Nate, Gus, and Joseph. They didn't drink. They didn't smoke. They didn't do drugs. They played football. They boxed. They wrestled and ran track. Three of my brothers joined the Army, and one brother joined the Marines. They never joined the game. They never stole a car. They never robbed anybody. They never raped anybody. They never snatched the purse. Sure, they was rough and tough around the edges. They had to be living where we live. And it is true, we were no angels, but they were no criminals either. Because one of my brothers became a Chicago police officer. Then he got promoted to the police academy to train other officers. One of my brothers became a Chicago fireman. It was my brothers who taught me about good sportsmanship, to play hard, be tough, but don't cheat and be fair. I want to thank and congratulate my one and only daughter, Lisa. She couldn't be here tonight because she's studying for her doctor's degree. And I want to thank and congratulate my right-hand man, my best man, my main man, a chip off the old block, my one and only son, T. Jr. Thank you for being a good son. And, and congratulations on receiving your master's degree. I'm proud of you, son, and your big sister, Lisa. Is it time? Sorry. 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 Welcome back to the 2014 WWE Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Good evening, Jerry the King Lawler. Well, let me just say that after listening to Mr. T's speech, I just want to say I love your mother too. I think we all love Mr. T's mother. As a matter of fact, I pity the fool that don't love Mr. T's mother. And speaking of mothers, my own mother always told me that if you don't have anything nice to say about anybody, don't say anything at all. So after what this next person wanted to do to me a couple of weeks, well, please welcome the big red monster, Kane. <laughs> He managed the most unique individual. What better man to guide the career of the Undertaker than Paul Bearer? 
Paul Bearer really was a big part of adding that mystique to The Undertaker. I've never seen anything like it! Paul Bearer, commanding the spirit of The Undertaker! I really feel that Paul Bearer had a great deal to do with the success of The Undertaker. It was just perfect, and with the urn, the ashes. And he had that, that high, shrivelly voice. He's scared of my Undertaker! Oh, and I wonder why! Whoever he was with is automatically legitimized. Undertaker, Mankind, Kane. He was just very important to the overall presentation. That's a testament to how good Paul Bearer was. You are my personal instrument of destruction! Death! Oh, what a word! Casket! Oh, what a word! Oh, bodies! He added a great deal to us. I guess he was probably the most unique manager in the history of the business. I hated to run Mr. T off, but all that talk about his mama was cutting into the time that I had to talk about my daddy, Paul Bearer. <laughs> Paul Bearer was born William Moody in Mobile, Alabama. Even when he lived elsewhere, Mobile would always be Bill's home. He got his first taste of professional wrestling when his parents took him to the television tapings at a local TV studio. By the time he was a teenager, Moody was hooked and was a fixture at events on the Gulf Coast. Incidentally, some of Bill's friends also ended up in the wrestling industry. Robert Gibson of the famed Rock and Roll Express. <laughs> Michael P.S. Hayes of the legendary, fabulous Freebirds. Moody got his first job in the wrestling business while he was still in high school as the ringside photographer for Gulf Coast Wrestling. Upon graduation from high school, he joined the United States Air Force, but was lucky enough to be stationed in Biloxi, Mississippi, which allowed him to continue attending events on the Gulf Coast. After being discharged from the Air Force, Moody went to work as a licensed apprentice funeral director. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, in one of the great ironies of our business, Paul Bearer was a mortician in real life. In 1974, Moody made his in-ring debut as Mr. X. Now, you can imagine with a name like Mr. X, his career as a wrestler was short-lived and uneventful. So he channeled his energy into managing and adopted the persona of Percival Pringle III. The flamboyant, bleach-blonde ringside manager. Percy was soon a mainstay in Florida Championship Wrestling as well as the Von Erichs World Class Championship Wrestling out of Texas. But then in 1990, everything changed. <laughs> Moody went to WWE and joined The Undertaker as his manager. And Paul Bearer was born. And as great and awesome as The Undertaker was in his own right, Paul Bearer, with his ghastly white face and his trademark shrill voice, completed the package, making The Undertaker the most unique and undoubtedly greatest character in WWE history. For years, The Undertaker would dominate WWE with Paul Bearer, the keeper of the sacred urn, at his side. But as usually happens in our business, the closest relationships end up spawning the most fearsome rivalries. And this was no exception, as Paul Bearer dedicated himself to destroying The Undertaker, utilizing the services of superstars like Vader 
in mankind. And then in mid-1997, Paul Bearer informed the dead man that he knew a deep, dark secret from the Undertaker's past. That secret, of course, was me. <laughs> Kane, the Undertaker's long-forgotten brother. Now, call me biased, but I believe that the undertaker Kane saga was the best piece of epic storytelling WWE has ever done. But it wouldn't have been possible without Paul Bearer. Paul Bearer was the bridge that connected Undertaker and Kane. I spent a number of years on the road with Paul Bearer. Not only was that some of the most fun of my career, but it's also some of the most easiest years of my career because Paul would make all the travel arrangements. Pretty much all I had to do was show up. He also converted me into a somewhat reluctant connoisseur of country music which, along with Alabama football and Mobile Mystics hockey, was one of the uh, great passions of his life. The only trouble that Paul and I ever had was when it was revealed that Paul Bear was Kane's father. From that point on, he never failed to hesitate to remind me of who my daddy was. And then there was the time that Paul said that he was ill and asked if I minded driving us to the arena that evening. Now, this was not too long after I had debuted, and in order to conceal my identity from you, the public, I always wore a ski mask when I arrived at the building. <laughs> so here we are. I believe we're pulling down the ramp in San Diego, California. Show sold out. WWE Universe has already packed the parking lot. Paul Bear is sitting in the passenger seat. I am trying to look as inconspicuous as possible while being an enormous man wearing a ski mask and driving a Cadillac. <laughs> when suddenly the ailing Paul Bearer perks to life, pops up, rolls down the window, and starts screaming in vintage Paul Bear fashion, it's a miracle! Kane can drive! Kane can drive! I'll never forgive him for that one. But nevertheless, out of all the great performers that Paul Bearer ever managed, I'm the one who owes him the most. Because if it hadn't been for Paul Bearer, there never would have been a cane. And for that, I am forever grateful. <laughs> Eventually, Paul's run with WWE would come to an end, but he never really left. He made occasional on-screen appearances, which always ended in his own demise, <laughs> as well as doing work behind the scenes. Paul loved to hear from his old friends in the wrestling business and was active in organizations like the Cauliflower Alley Club. He forged personal relationships with fans from around the, glo from around the globe via the internet and social media. And he could be found in the corner time to time of one DJ Pringle at independent shows on the Gulf Coast. This past spring, William Moody went to join his beloved wife, Diana, in their eternal rest. The world lost a great entertainer, and those of us close to him lost a great friend. At his funeral, I was struck by the outpouring of sentiment from fans from around the world, and it occurred to me that Paul Bearer was what all of us who enter this wonderful business aspire to be, an international superstar. <laughs> Paul would have a final curtain call with WWE as he played an important role in The Undertaker's match at WrestleMania 29. Knowing how much he loved this business, I don't believe that I could think 
that Paul could think of a more fitting memorial than to be on the grandest stage of them all one more time. But tonight we pay him the ultimate tribute as we induct one of the greatest managers of all time, Paul Bear, into the WWE Hall of Fame. Here to accept this honor on behalf of their father, please join me in welcoming his sons, Michael and David, Michael and Daniel Moody. Thank you. Do we know who our daddy is? <laughs> well, I do. Just want to say on behalf of the whole Moody family, we want to thank the whole WWE universe for being able to share our father with all of you. And of course, we can't leave until this final thing is said. Oh! 